According to the CDC, malaria is a serious and sometimes fatal disease caused by a parasite that commonly infects a certain type of mosquito which feeds on humans. In the U.S., there are approximately 1,700 cases of malaria diagnosed every year, which really pales in comparison when you look at the global estimate, according to the World Health Organization, which is around 216 million cases of malaria and accounting for over 400,000 malaria-related deaths. And today's show is relevant because for U.S. consumers who travel to malaria-prone regions of the world, whether it's for leisure travel or to fulfill uh, their military deployment obligation or commitment, well, those folks are oftentimes prescribed some sort of anti-malarial drug. Now, the biggest question we should ask ourselves in taking any drug especially if it's one we've never taken before, is what are the risks associated with this drug? And these antimalarials are no exception. And why? Well, because these antimalarials, which come from the quinoline family of drugs, can lead to not just side effects in an individual person, but they may cause a disease called chronic quinoline encephalopathy or neuropsychiatric quinism. These antimalarial drugs or quinoline type of drugs have gone by names like mefloquin uh, or tofinoquin. And our guest today is Dr. Remington Nevin. Uh, He's the founder and executive director of the Quinism Foundation. And Dr. Nevin is going to get a little bit more in detail about this drug-induced disease and his organization But let's just say that what he has to share is nothing short of concerning and that every U.S. consumer should know exactly what is happening when it comes to these types of drugs and the consequences or the risk associated with these types of anti-malarials. You're listening to episode number 21 of Overprescribed, the show that raises America's awareness on pharmaceutical medications in this country, all in an effort to help you, the everyday consumer, to live the safest, healthiest, and most informed medication experience possible. I'm your host, Mika Pollock, and let's listen in to today's interview with Dr. Remington Nevin. Dr. Nevin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being available. Um, when I first uh, became aware of you, um, I was actually introduced to you um, by means of an investigative report that I read online a couple months ago about an anti-malarial drug exposure um, circumstance with veterans or military personnel. And um, we were able to get introduced by the investigative reporting team that did that report. And um I've had a chance now to really learn a lot about your foundation. Um, so I wonder if we could start there. Um, tell us a little bit more about the Quinism Foundation, the inspiration behind it, and you know what is the, the main emphasis that you know your team is working on at this time? Yeah, sure. Great to question, uh, questions, Mika. Thank you. So, so we are a, a, a new nonprofit. We were established at the start of 2018. Uh, based here in uh, Vermont, and, and our, our mission is to promote and support education and research on on the family of medical disorders caused by poisoning by quinoline drugs. And, and the most common quinoline drugs in use today are, are quinoline antimalarials, uh, particularly uh, mefloquine, but also primaquine, chloroquine, and a new drug recently licensed called uh, tefenoquine. It's, it's our position that this class of drugs causes a disease uh, in, in much the same way that exposure to lead can cause a disease known as lead poisoning or chronic lead encephalopathy that's associated with chronic neuropsychiatric effects. So, so too can exposure to quinolines cause a disease called quinoline poisoning or mefloquine poisoning in the case of mefloquine. And uh, we call that neuropsychiatric quinism for short. Okay. Yeah, actually, the the report that I read was focused mainly around mefloquine. And I I got from that reporting that drug had been 
widely prescribed over a number of years. So I guess that's kind of the grandfather story, if you will, um, as to what's kind of led to this symptomatic disease called quinism. Well, actually, the, the interesting thing is that this this class of drug, the quinoline antimalarial drugs, have, have been in use for several centuries. Quinine, which is a naturally occurring uh, drug, it's it's extracted from the bark of the cinchona tree. This is the prototypical drug of the class, and it was in use for many hundreds of years uh, by colonial powers in particular to help control uh, malaria. And then, of course, the, uh, this past century, with the uh, with World War II and then subsequent wars, uh, a number of synthetic anti-malarial compounds structurally related to quinine came into widespread use. There was a drug called adabrin or quinacrine that was used during World War II very widely in, in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Two drugs, uh, primaquine and chloroquine, were widely used. And, and mefloquine only came about uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam war once uh, widespread resistance to chloroquine had developed. Uh, and the, the same uh, pattern of signs and symptoms, the same adverse effects we, we see today very commonly with mefloquine, we believe, in, in fact, were, were also very common with use of these earlier drugs. So, so we suspect that a, a similar uh, problem with uh, neuropsychiatric adverse effects uh, affected our troops uh, going back even as far as World War II when quinoquine quinoquin was uh, widely used. Hmm. Okay, so it goes back many, many, many years. Um, so it, it kind of makes you wonder then, how do we get to this point now um, of realizing that, you know, these types of anti-malarial drugs um, may cause serious problems in people. When did when did it really start to kind of emerge that there was a problem and that there was a tension that needed to be put on this issue? So the major factor that has limited awareness and recognition uh, of of the adverse effect profile of this class of drugs was the fact that this class of drug was always a ubiquitous exposure in cases of malaria disease. No, nobody survived malaria disease without being exposed to high doses of this class of drug. Mm. And so we suspect that most of the adverse effects of these drugs have been historically misattributed to malaria. People recovering from malaria that developed serious psychiatric or neurological problems up until recently, those problems had been attributed to the sequelae of malaria disease. And it's only recently, with the widespread use of these drugs in prophylaxis, meaning in prevention uh, of malaria disease, and particularly in the widespread use of these drugs among people that weren't deploying to war zones and that had no other plausible explanation for the development of very serious psychiatric effects in the aftermath of that use, did, did we begin to recognize that these drugs have inherent toxicity, independent of any other exposures and independent of whether you go on to develop malaria. It, it's really quite remarkable that it's taken decades for the dangers of this class of drug to be recognized. But in, in fact, that's not as uncommon as, as we might think. Several examples uh, in the medical literature of, of dangers of drugs that are only recognized many, many decades after their, their, their first use. Mm. Yeah. So to talk about uh, some of the the symptoms of this neuro neuropsychiatric quinism. Um, let's talk about some of the, sp the specifics because, you know, on the quinism.org website, you do a very good job of identifying a multitude of, of adverse reactions um, that have been linked to this, these particular drugs, mefloquine, tofenoquin. And so it's such a long list and some of these are really serious. I, I just want to have a moment to talk about some of those um, symptom symptomatologies. Sure. So th there's probably no better source uh, for a general audience than the very boxed warnings that the manufacturer uh, has, has put on uh, these drugs. Mefloquine is, is the best example of this. Um, mefloquine now carries a black box warning or a boxed warning in several jurisdictions, the United States, Canada, and throughout the European Union, it says very clearly that mefloquine may induce psychiatric symptoms such as 
anxiety disorders, paranoia, depression, hallucinations, and psychosis. And then the interesting line, psychiatric symptoms such as insomnia, abnormal dreams, nightmares, acute anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion have to be regarded as prodromal for a more serious event. And then immediately afterwards, cases of suicide, suicidal thoughts, and self-endangering behavior, such as attempted suicide, have been reported. And, and this interesting warning, patients on malaria chemoprophylaxis, meaning taking mefloquin to prevent malaria, should be informed that if these reactions, meaning psychiatric symptoms, or changes to their mental state occur during, during mefloquin use, to stop taking mefloquin and seek medical advice immediately so that mefloquin can be replaced by alternative medications. And then the warning goes on to say adverse reactions may also occur after discontinuation of the drug, meaning they can occur, their onset can occur after discontinuation of the drug. And in a small number of patients, it's been reported that neuropsychiatric reactions, e.g. depression, dizziness, or vertigo, and loss of balance may persist for months or longer, even after discontinuation of the drug. So, so they're describing um, a fairly well-defined toxidrome uh, or, or disease uh, caused by poisoning of the brain by this uh, drug. We believe that uh, mefloquine poisoning induces a, a toxic encephalopathy of the central nervous system that primarily affects the limbic system or the emotional centers of the brain as well as the brain stem and that this drug, if it continues to be used, in, in the presence of, of this developing encephalopathy can actually injure the central nervous system and, and, and cause small lesions, small areas of focal cell death uh, throughout the brainstem and limbic system. And, and, and this suspicion, this belief is, is confirmed in a number of animal model studies uh, going back to the World War II era when, when drugs of this class were, were found to produce what the scientists at the time described as a very striking pattern of uh, injury uh, to the, the brain and brain stem. And it just so happens that the signs and symptoms that we see from poisoning of this class of drug reflects perfectly the localization of this pattern of injury within the limbic system and brain stem. So injury to the hippocampus, that part of the limbic system responsible for, for memory and attention, um, injury to various sections of the brainstem that are involved in uh, the control of balance. Uh, this, this corresponds perfectly to what we see with mefloquin use causing, for example, symptoms of confusion uh, and uh, symptoms of vertigo and dizziness. Mm. Now, would you say that, you know, even though some of the symptoms here that you've described are clearly outlined, particularly when it comes to black box warning supported by different research studies, would you say that the black box warnings aren't enough and there's more that needs to be done aside from just listing these, these out for the medical community, for the consumer community um, and what more really needs to be done to, to make some type of, I guess, positive public health uh, step in protecting sure. people from these right. types of these types of reactions. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so imagine if if you can imagine if lead, imagine if lead salts had some sort of therapeutic benefit in in, in some very rare uh, disease, and and so some pharmaceutical manufacturer were to sell some tincture that contains lead, right? Well, the label of that medicine should very clearly say. This contains a neurotoxic substance, lead. Lead can cause lead poisoning. There is no safe level of lead. Symptoms of lead poisoning include such and such. And, and there's, there's a very real risk of long-term disability associated with use of this product. Someone could read that label and decide together with their physician if, if this risk was appropriate. I think the evidence is, is similarly clear enough now that drug regulators should be acknowledging that use of this class of drug carries a risk of a disease called quinoline poisoning. Mefloquin poisoning is a disease. And rather than being side effects of this drug, these, these symptoms, the vivid dreams, the nightmares, the crippling insomnia and parasomnias, 
the uh, often disabling anxiety, panic, depression, confusion, and the various neurological symptoms that often accompany these. Not to mention more serious psychosis and suicidality. These are all symptoms of a disease called quinism, neuropsychiatric quinism, uh, that can occur idiosyncratically with use of these drugs. Uh, and this disease is chronic and disabling. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that information uh, should be shared with those that are considering using these drugs. Now, is the medical community recognizing neuropsychiatric quinism as an actual um, diagnosis of disease? Like, for example, if someone went to you know their doctor and was assessed to, to have this condition, would they be able to basically file a health claim for this? Is it being recognized um, by health providers, uh, insurance providers? So the disease itself, the disease that we have named quinism, isn't yet recognized in mm -hmm. the medical community. This takes time, right? right. It, it takes time for the medical journals uh, to publish papers, for the textbooks to be updated, for consensus to emerge. Uh, I'm very confident that uh, now that we have described this disease, now that we've described the signs and symptoms, we've, we've explained the likely pathophysiology of this disease, and, and we've begun to describe the characteristics of this disease, the same way characteristics of other diseases are, are, are described in the medical literature, that, that it's only a matter of time before mm -hmm. individual clinicians start to recognize this in their patients. And instead of uh, mistakenly attributing uh, the symptoms of, of folks suffering from this disorder to things like bipolar disorder, in the case of veterans, post-traumatic stress disorder, separately attributing the neurological symptoms to, to um, uh, radiculopathies uh, or um, the vertigo and dizziness to things like Meniere's disease. We, we feel confident that when clinicians begin to recognize this, this fairly distinct constellation of signs and symptoms, that they will begin to label everything uh, simply as mefloquine poisoning in the, in the case of, of mefloquine. And in, in due course, um, the medical community will assign it to formal diagnosis, a formal diagnosis code. It will become something that um, can, can be commonly uh, assigned uh, at the point of, of care. But, but conservatively, that will take maybe five years or right. so. And it's, it's really the purpose of our foundation. The Quinism Foundation is, is to get to that point where this is a, a recognized um, disease. In, in the meantime, what we are seeing is we are seeing many clinicians begin to attribute uh, separate neurologic and psychiatric disorders to the drug. So, for example, uh, at, at one point, uh, I saw uh, a typical veteran, for example, suffering mefloquine poisoning, being diagnosed with somatoform or conversion disorder and possibly uh, one or more uh, psychiatric or, or neurological conditions. And this was the clinician's best way of explaining this very unusual presentation. But now I'm beginning to see um, veterans in similar circumstances being diagnosed with um, central vertigo or a central vestibulopathy secondary to mefloquine toxicity and separately an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder or some kind of mood disorder due to the effects of a substance. In, in other words, mefloquine. Mm -hmm. And 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 so the, the diagnostic picture is becoming much more clear in attributing these effects to mefloquine. But rather than assign all of these separate diagnoses, I, I think at, at some point, in, in much the same way that someone with very complex neuropsychiatric symptomatology might simply be diagnosed with multiple sclerosis to explain their various signs and symptoms, uh, so too do I expect that in, in due course, someone who, who suffered mefloquine poisoning, who presents with various psychiatric and neurological symptoms, if attributed by the clinician to mefloquine poisoning, rather than be assigned four or five different diagnoses, they'll simply be diagnosed with quinism. And I think that will make the management uh, and, and subsequent uh, treatment of, of that patient much more straightforward. Yeah, I agree. I wonder, though, do you think there's going to be some type of 
added complication, which probably also may attribute to kind of the lack of acceptance or recognition in the community uh, about this this disease. But do you think that there's complication related to the fact that, you know, people are sometimes on more than one medication? They may be misdiagnosed or uh, underdiagnosed or delayed diagnosis. Because, I mean, looking at even some of the, the list of um, of symptoms, you know, d- dizziness, vertigo, visual sure. disturbances, you know, that it's, it's very common to see that on hundreds of medications and labeling. And so I wonder how complicated um, the diagnosis is going to be, particularly in, in patients and consumers who have been exposed to multiple medications um, over time or, or at the same time as their exposure to mefloquine, for example. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not I'm not nearly as, as pessimistic as, as you are, Mika. It, it's it based on my experience. It's, this is actually one of the easiest diagnoses to make. The mm. the history uh, generally is sufficient to to diagnose this. What, what you tend to see in cases of neuropsychiatric uh, quinism is is in general a healthy person uh, who who's fit to travel or who is fit to be in the military. So generally at a fairly high level of of functioning at the time they are prescribed the drug. And of course, the drug is contraindicated in in anyone who's not in that state. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with with folks that come in with with good baseline mental health. And and what we see is is quite often uh, symptoms beginning well before exposure to any sort of plausible traumatic stress, Uh, because typically the drug uh, is, is initiated prior to travel. And so when we see uh, a patient presenting with horrific nightmares and crippling insomnia and, and, and uh, debilitating anxiety and panic and, and quite often more pathognomonic symptoms such as um, obvious confusion or uh, hallucinations prior to any plausible traumatic stressor, uh, or overseas exposure. Well, then, then the cause of that is obvious, isn't it? it? It's the drug that was just initiated. And if these symptoms continue for weeks to months or years uh, after that initial exposure to the drug, well, then it's also obvious what the cause of, of that symptomatology is. It's perfectly consistent with what we would expect from a neurotoxic drug that uh, injures uh, the brain. Um, and, and so if we see the development of, if we see the evolution of symptoms, if, if we see these symptoms with onset right before a deployment or right before travel, and then you see the characteristic progression of symptoms to include such things as a vertigo uh, or dizziness, which on testing is very clearly referable to uh, dysfunction in the brainstem. If we see the development of uh, paresthesias uh, that does not have a more obvious peripheral cause. If we see the development of uh, neurooptometric uh, dysfunction, uh, that's also clearly referable to uh, the brainstem. Uh, and, and then we see the development of other symptoms that are plausibly consistent with brainstem dysfunction to include chronic gastrointestinal dysfunction, which is attributable to dysfunction in the vagus nerve uh, or dysfunction in um, uh the esophagus uh, or uh, or a pharynx. Um, it's consistent with dysfunction of other cranial nerve nuclei, including the hypoglossal uh, nucleus. Then, then it, the most parsimonious explanation, meaning the explanation that requires the fewest assumptions, that is the simplest, most elegant, most consistent with um, available evidence, is that all of the person's signs and symptoms are attributable to, to a poisoning by this class of drug. Uh, my, my experience is that most veterans who've been poisoned know that their their ill health is due to mefloquine. And, and many have been struggling for decades to convince the medical profession of what they already know, because people generally know when they've been poisoned. In general, you know when you've been poisoned, particularly if the onset is so sudden as it is with, with mefloquine, typically. So I, I think once the medical profession understands the the plausible pathophysiology once once they understand the biological mechanisms that underlie this disorder then then i think this is going to be recognized almost entirely by history simply by listening to the patient and taking their story and and occasionally doing some confirmatory testing to to confirm the presence of these objective neurologic abnormalities 
Recently, uh, the Quinism Foundation called on the CDC to update its malaria prevention recommendations to reflect important FDA safety warnings for tofenaquin and mefloquin. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. This is really a long time uh, coming. The, the, the CDC, I think, has, has, has been fairly negligent in not doing more to emphasize the important safety warnings uh, that, that, that first were, were made very clear with the 2013 boxed warning. And in, in fact, we have some emails that we obtained from FOIA that show very clearly CDC staff were trivializing and even dismissing the significance of these FDA warnings. The, the FDA doesn't elevate safety warnings to a boxed warning unless there's evidence that doing so is necessary to better protect the public's health. And, and what was happening that led to the elevation of these warnings to a box warning was that the important guidance in the mefloquine product label to discontinue the drug at the onset of psychiatric symptoms was being widely ignored. And unfortunately, uh, many individuals that, that work for CDC that have been responsible for uh, promulgating these recommendations have have themselves been implicated in the trivialization of this important guidance. There are, there are many folks that would probably say privately they don't believe the significance of these warnings. But the, the problem is that the folks at CDC may be experts in malaria, but they're not experts in drug safety. They're, right. they're, they don't have the same skill set that drug regulators have. And, and their job is not to make these types of determinations on, on drug safety or or best practices for, for drug use, keeping safety in mind. That's FDA's job. And FDA has made very clear, the drug manufacturer has made very clear from the start that if you develop, for example, anxiety while taking mefloquine, you must stop taking the drug because this could be your only warning sign of a developing encephalopathy that, that, that could lead to chronic neuropsychiatric disability. And, and in fact, since 2002, FDA has warned that any psychiatric symptom requires the drug's discontinuation. And drug regulators in Europe have now made perfectly clear this includes insomnia, nightmares, and vivid dreams. And these symptoms affect well over 10% of those taking mefloquine. So if you have a nightmare on mefloquine, you must stop taking the drug. There's no question about that. Mm. And any physician that counsels their patient otherwise, and that patient is subsequently harmed, they, they face significant legal exposure as a result of, of, of not properly advising their patient. And I, I've been privy to several lawsuits uh, where that issue came up improperly guiding patients. So the CDC, by not, adv by not updating their recommendations to reflect these important warnings, are, are placing, in my mind, travelers at risk by, by not sharing this critical safety information. So, so we have asked the head of CDC to ensure that the next update to malaria prevention guidelines, emphasize what the drugs manufacturer makes clear, that if you're going to be prescribing mefloquin, you ensure the patient understands that if they develop vivid dreams, nightmares, or insomnia, or any other psychiatric symptom, they must immediately stop taking the drug. Now, I, I think that this guidance makes the use of mefloquin inherently impractical. It's, it's, very, it's very impractical to prescribe a drug to someone going on overseas travel to discontinue the drug at the onset of insomnia, it's particularly if you're going across time zones and you expect to develop insomnia, it's almost certain that you will misattribute any insomnia from the drug to the stresses of your travel. And that's very risky because if your insomnia is actually due in part to, to a drug effect, then you could be risking permanent disability by continuing the drug. So I think it's inherently irresponsible. It's negligent, in fact, to prescribe this drug to individuals going on certain types of travel, in particular travel across time zones, deployments to stressful environments such as humanitarian emergencies or disaster response or military deployments, obviously. Mm -hmm. And and we've made that guidance very clear. But we, we've also pointed out that the new drug, tofenaquin, which, which is coming on the market now, it was recently approved, FDA has added similar warnings to tofenaquin. FDA says that if you're taking tofenaquin and you develop nightmares, insomnia, anxiety, or changes in mood that are severe or that last more than three days, immediately seek out a medical professional. And, and we think that is going to be challenging for travelers 
Imagine if you're traveling to sub-Saharan Africa and you've been experiencing three days of insomnia, then the FDA is advising you to seek immediate medical advice. But how can you do that if you're traveling and you're in the jungle and all the healthcare professionals may not even speak your language? So, so we have advised CDC that, that, that certainly certain types of travel, particularly military deployments, are not compatible, in our opinion, with tefenequin use. And, and we're going to be monitoring what CDC eventually recommends. And, and if, if it, it doesn't appear that the travel medicine community is taking these warnings seriously, then we're going to be petitioning FDA to elevate these warnings to a boxed warning on tefenequin. Uh, as well. And and we're confident that such a petition will, in fact, uh, meet with success. Right. I I can't see why it wouldn't. I mean, I I would think that the CDC would want to inform travelers of any and all public health risks that they could encounter um, prior to their trip and during their trip. And I, I would hope that, as you mentioned, the CDC some folks with the CDC may lack some of the understanding around specific drug safety issues and regulation that those of the FDA would have. So I would hope that the CDC and the FDA could collaborate in some way um, when it comes to these types of communications to consumers. Um, do, do you think that's going to be the logical step well, they have to take? I, I would say that, that the, the collaboration you Describe it would be fairly unique in this in this setting, right? So dr- drug regulators, the drug manufacturer and drug regulators, have made very clear in the product insert what the correct use of the drug is, and so it's the it's the role of CDC in this context to faithfully implement uh, that guidance in their recommendations to not second guess it, and and what we've seen is is that CDC and the travel medicine community, frankly, the larger travel medicine community. Uh, has has adopted uh, a very unusual uh, policy of, of, of trivializing, um, dismissing um, safety guidance uh, promulgated by by these other uh, bodies. And and again, they lack the expertise uh, and and knowledge and experience to to do that. And and of course, they do it at their own peril because we we've, we've seen uh, how the misuse of mefloquine over the last quarter century. Has has led to um, the disastrous uh, outcome that we we face today. So so mefloquine was once uh, widely um, uh, it was it was it was looked forward to by the by the malariology and travel medicine community as, as almost a silver bullet for the treatment and prevention of malaria, uh, but primarily because these warnings were overlooked. Uh, and were consistently overlooked for past quarter century of the drug's use. Now, mefloquine has been relegated to the back of the medicine cabinet. It's it's lost almost all, all of its utility, um, uh, and is is by policy in many settings uh, all but uh, prohibited. And it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be that way. Al- although there are certain settings where use of the drug is inherently challenging and, and should probably be. Uh, prohibited or recommended against. There, 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 there are some individuals that seem to tolerate mefloquine fairly well, uh, but the misuse of the drug in other populations uh, has, has, has threatened the use of the drug in, in that small proportion that do seem to tolerate it well. And, and it, it's, it's really tragic because this, this, the, whole, the, the problems we've had with mefloquine over the last quarter century could have mostly been prevented had the malariology and travel medicine communities, I think, been less arrogant uh, in their approach to the drug and, and less insistent that um, critics of the drug uh, were misguided or incorrect. And in fact, what the last quarter century has shown is that the critics of the drug have been right all along. And, mm-hmm. and I think these communities should learn something from that. And, and it, what's, what's troubling is that it appears from recent uh, events that they haven't learned anything. From mefloquine, that that they're they're on track to repeat these same mistakes with the new drug to mm-hmm. and ho- hopefully it won't take a, another quarter century for these mistakes to be recognized. Right. It, it sounds to me is it, that unless unless regulators, um, healthcare teams, providers uh, start to recognize 
this disease and start to do things to prevent the, I guess, the prevalence of the disastrous dis- disabling results in, in, in people who are taking the drug that we're poised to repeat, as you mentioned, um, the mefloquine and tifenoquine is clearly poised to be the new mefloquine. But it sounds like the, the Quinism Foundation is, is doing something about this. Are there other are there other people or other uh, waves of initiatives going on to try to bring forth the awareness and the change in the medical community to protect consumers? Well, we, we, we find ourselves in the Kunism Foundation, we find ourselves in a, a very unusual position because we find ourselves uh, not, not wishing to, to do this, but unfortunately we have no choice very often to be, to be very critical of the malariology community the malariology and travel medicine communities. And this is, this is an unusual situation uh, for any public health advocacy group to find itself in, to, to be essentially involved in, in a conflict with, with its own kind, right? We're all in public health. My, my, I, I did a lot of work in malariology before I began to, began to focus on, on quinism and mefloquine poisoning. And I, I share the malariology's, malariology community's concern with malaria as a major global public health threat. Um, but I'm very concerned at the costs of the unintended consequences of the actions of the malariology community, their, their failure over time to recognize the very serious adverse effects of, of one class of drug that has been a cornerstone in, in malaria uh, control and elimination efforts. Uh, at the FDA meeting several weeks back, I made the point that there is a real risk that in our efforts to eradicate, that's perhaps too ambitious a goal, in our attempts to eliminate malaria, we run the risk of causing an equal or comparable burden of neuropsychiatric disease to, to the burden of more be- uh, of disease from malaria that, that we are trying to uh, eliminate. And there, there are there are few comparable scenarios like that in public health. There, there are few comparable scenarios where well-intentioned uh, advocates in public health find themselves um, in opposition to each other's uh, efforts. So, so for that reason, we are quite isolated. We don't have a lot of natural allies. The malariology community as a whole is generally very uh, hostile to our efforts. They, they, they view their efforts as essential to save the world. They're out there sacrificing uh, themselves, placing, placing often their lives in real danger, trying to eliminate this deadly threat of malaria. And here's this small group of, of safety advocates concerned about nightmares and vivid dreams. I, from their perspective, I understand why they see us in that light. But if they recognized that when you do the math, when you actually look at the cost, that the disease they are eliminating through their efforts could very well be being replaced by a comparable burden of morbidity as a result of drug poisoning, then I hope they will rethink their their um, displeasure with our efforts. I, I'm I'm confident in due course we will become allied with the malariology community, but it's up to them to recognize the dangers of of their their past actions. And un- unfortunately, that's not something we can necessarily speed ourselves. And, mm-hmm. and no no amount of lobbying or support by other organizations would speed that process, right? That, that's, some, that's something that the malariology community needs to recognize on their own. And, and over time, there have been a few leaders in the malariology community that have spoken out against the dangers of these, these drugs, but, but their voices are relatively um, few in comparison to those in the malariology community that would seek to essentially um, trivialize and, and dismiss uh, any and all concerns related to these drugs. Do you think a lot of that comes from the fact that uh, these malariology groups are pushing the treatment and, 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 and therefore if you kind of ease back on that um, or start to speak counter to that, it's almost going to take 
you know, everything that they've ever said, every messaging that they put out to their constituents and, and just, you know, completely deflate that message. Um, well, yeah. So, so I think you're, you're speaking to some of the more complex personality driven issues. It's very difficult for anyone to admit they were wrong. And it's, it's, it's much more difficult for someone to admit they were wrong when the cost of their being incorrect uh, is measured in disability or lives lost. It, it's our contention that the widespread use of this class of drug has been accompanied by widespread neuropsychiatric disability, that in many populations, for example, military use of mefloquine, that the use of this class of drug has actually cost more lives and has created more disability than use of the next best class of drug. So, so the entire use of, of, of this class of drug in certain populations has caused more harm than good. And this is not something that I expect will be accepted easily by many in the malariology community who have themselves been responsible for much of this. But we can't make progress until that realization occurs and until there is acceptance of these facts. Um, and I've been asked many times, well, would you be willing to concede, Dr. Nevin, that they were trying their best and, and, and they really had no choice and, and that use of this drug was, was um, really uh, forced upon us by circumstance? And in most cases, I argue no, that particularly in the U.S. military, there was never a need to use mefloquine. We always had safer uh, alternatives. And so it's, it's going to be a very painful process uh, for the U.S. military and those involved in setting anti-malarial drug policy over the last few decades to, to accept that, that this epidemic was entirely preventable, was entirely unnecessary, was, was in large part fueled by hubris and arrogance um, and matters that had nothing at all to do with malaria or concern for public health, but, but uh, more complex national security and, and policy implications that unfortunately led to uh, many veterans being uh, suffering the collateral damage of those decisions. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So speaking of safer alternatives, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that was something I also want to bring up as well. You know, there's going to be people, of course, listening to the show and they'll be wondering, you know, well, if I don't take, you know, you know, any of these drugs that have been named so far, you know, what what should I do if I'm going to a malaria prone, you know, region of the world? Um, what do I do to protect myself and my family? And and how can I go about that? So there there are always alternatives. Uh, we, we saw that in the aftermath of, of some recent health scares that CDC recommended against pregnant women, for example, traveling to certain areas where disease is prevalent. And, and so uh, pregnant women do not necessarily need to travel to malaria endemic areas. If, if they're told that there is a drug that's safe, that doesn't injure the fetus, that carries very little risk to the mother, they may be more likely to uh, go on optional travel under those circumstances. So, so uh, mefloquine has very few indications for which it is deemed the best choice. Whatever, wh whatever use case mefloquine may have today for most travelers is generally uh, argued um, in, in the name of convenience and, or cost or, or so on. But, but there, there are safer, better tolerated alternatives to mefloquine for, for adult travelers uh, for most the children, and in the in the few rare cases where mefloquine is still considered a first line drug, infants, children, pregnant women in particular, uh, I could argue uh, that the drug is actually not safe to use in those populations, and really shouldn't be recommended as a first line drug. That, that other alternatives, including in many cases mosquito avoidance, bite prevention, uh, or simply limiting travel. Uh, should should be considered perfect example. Uh, so so the the drug regulators in Europe uh, have said very clearly you must discontinue mefloquine if insomnia or nightmares begin, uh, or or if if subtle psychiatric symptoms such as depression or anxiety begin. Well, those symptoms certainly affect children and infants the way they affect. Adults. There's, there's no reason a priori to assume that 
children aren't suffering the same psychiatric effects from a toxic encephalopathy that adults do. But if you're administering mefloquine to your infant child every week, how do you know that your child is not suffering from vivid dreams or nightmares? Children often wake up crying. So how do you know Mm -hmm. if your child is experiencing nightmares? They have no way to verbalize what they may be experiencing. And a change in mental state in an infant is very difficult to ascertain. Um, And arguably, every infant should probably be assumed to be having a change in mental state associated with travel. So I would argue that the drug is inherently unsafe to use in infants because the FDA uh, and EMA guidance cannot be followed. And similarly, in the extreme case of a pregnant woman whose fetus is also being exposed to mefloquine, whose brain is also being exposed to mefloquine. Obviously, the mother has no idea if that fetus might be experiencing horrific nightmares. There's no reason to think that uh, developing fetuses, particularly in late trimesters, aren't experiencing nightmares while on mefloquine the same way that uh, infants and adults do. So so I think that that use of this drug in in pregnant women, infants, and children uh, is very dangerous. Uh, and and has been permitted for so long because of a systematic bias in the assessment of adverse effects in these populations and a very naive assumption that just because these aren't being reported, they're not occurring. And I think that's very, very dangerous. So so there's there's absolutely no reason, I think, to justify use of these drugs in, in that population. Agreed, 100%. Dr. Nevin, I am so thankful for you to come on the show today. I think you shared a lot of good information with our audience. Uh, Before you go, if you could just do two things for me. Um, One, I would love it for you to tell our audience how they can get in contact with you if they are so interested to do that. And two, tell us more about how we can support the Quinism Foundation. Sure. So so, uh, if someone has general questions for me, wants to learn more about uh, my research or be directed to uh, general uh, resources that can contact me at, uh, at my website, remingtonnevin.com. All one word. You can search for me, Remington Nevin. I, I should pop up our, our organization. Our nonprofit is the Quinism Foundation, quinism.org. Uh, we, we don't uh, directly solicit uh, donations uh, due, due to uh, state laws against charitable solicitation, but there are a number of, of uh, nonprofit uh, organizations such as the PayPal Giving Fund, uh, Network for Good, uh, that you can access through GuideStar. All of these um, uh, charitable uh, organizations uh, that are donor-advised funds, they, they do have us listed as a registered uh, charity, and uh, individuals can support those uh, charities uh, and select the, the charity of their choice to have their donations uh, directed uh, there. So uh, we would certainly encourage people to support the charity of their choice, uh, but we don't we don't solicit donations directly to our organization. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Thank you so much again. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Great talking to you, Nika. <laughs>